Wealth doesn't just happen. You have to go after it and build it. And the chase can be packed with thrills, frustration, and adventure. Join hosts Gail and Chris on a journey into mortgage notes, a little-known but fascinating type of real estate investing that's full of human drama and perfect for growing your IRA or savings. We build wealth by working with distressed borrowers who are fighting to keep their homes, and that's why we call it Good Deeds Note Investing. We're doing good and making money. Join us. Do you have a need for legal counsel for your foreclosure, forfeiture, or eviction in Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana, Michigan, or Illinois? Do you have an account in bankruptcy in those states and need to discuss the matter and your options? How about an account that goes into bankruptcy in any of the 94 bankruptcy jurisdictions? The attorneys and staff at Sotili and Barilli are here to assist you with those matters and more. Head on over to our Facebook page or our website at www.sotiliambarilli.com to find out more and to reach out to our team. When legal default experience matters, choose the team at Sotili and Barilli. Hello, everybody. This is Chris Seventy, co-host of the Good Deeds Note Investing Podcast. And this episode is an encore presentation to our open mic night. When we held the last open mic night, it continued on. And when we wrapped up the episode, people stayed on and started asking more questions. So what we did is we brought back on Dan Deppen and Chad Herbshot and reopened the conversation. And while we were discussing it, we wanted to make this available to our listeners as well. So hope you enjoy our encore presentation of this open mic night. Thank you all. We are back for a special <laughs> edition. It's like, it's like we're a rock band coming out afterwards, to, you know, at the encore of the good sure. news. So we've got Dan Deppin and Chad Herbshot on with us as well talking. Uh, talking about who's got the worst house yeah. In the country, and it's quite a face-off. Yeah, and BPOs <laughs> and other things. I actually never talked about the one I'm rehabbing right now in St. Louis. Well, East St. Louis, Belleville, Illinois, to be exact. Probably the worst house I've ever had to rehab in my life. My uh, budget going in was mid-20s. I'm at 55 right now. Oh. <laughs> Ow. However, wow. the... Uh, First realtor told me it was only worth 50 if fixed up, and now I'm at 100. So um, I could have sold it at a loss, as everybody mm -hmm. has talked about earlier. But I have endeavored, since I got into notes, to never lose money mm. once again on real estate. There's too many different exit strategies where you can make money regardless of how you do it. So if worse comes to worse, I'm going to sell this sucker on a seller finance deal which I'll probably end up doing. Well, I may or may not. If I get a retail price for a conventional mortgage that I need something for my pain and suffering, I want to make at least 10 grand, <laughs> which will probably make about five bucks an hour after all the time I put into it. But I didn't lose money on it, so. <laughs> That's what counts. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and Chad, just because, again, you mentioned earlier your experience and you know, you've got vast real estate experience and you just mentioned that you had a budget that went over double. So I say that because it happens to everybody, but for people who are newer that really haven't done a lot of this, you know, for the most experienced people like Chad, it happens. So just be very careful. And, you know, again, when you're doing rehabs, the biggest thing I'll mention to people is, you know, make sure you have a schedule of values and how people are getting paid is one of the most important things that's involved because rehabs, they can go take a left turn so quickly. I have somebody I know who wasn't a rehab or doing new construction and I offered to review their plans and help them on this property and their budget was 400 grand and they ended up spending 700,000 on their property. Uh -huh. And this was simple things like, they dropped their basement to get an extra foot in the basement, but never had the engineer look at where the sewer lateral was out in the street. So basically, they didn't have the pitch now, so they had to put pump it now as well. And I mean, nice. things like that. I mean, yeah, one of my advantages on my rehab is um, my property manager lives two doors away. Mm -hmm. And so he's going to kind of bird dog the rehab. And then when it comes time to put a renter in, he wants to find the renter. So I figure that's probably a good thing if he's, you know, he'll hopefully find someone good if he's going to have to be their neighbor. So well, he has a friend or family member who already has their eye on it. 
Hey, yeah. Chad, I want to go back to something you put where you said you never use BPOs. You just take the bottom five yeah. of all comps. Do you, I'm excited because I think they're worthless too, basically. So, <laughs> yeah. So back in the day when I first started buying uh, foreclosures, 2012, 13, like right from the county auctions, I was pulling my hair out because there would be a couple hundred a week that were coming up. And I'm like, how the hell am I going to peg the value of all these? You know, Zillow back then was even way worse than it is now for values. So I developed a tool that I still, well, I haven't really actually tweaked it lately, but um, what it does is it pulls um, 25 nearest comps in the area for each property. And it's not all that accurate, but it's, it's somewhat accurate. But I developed it at the time to get an ARV of a property. So I was pulling the top five comps. Well, when I started investing in notes, I tweaked it a bit more so that I can pull the bottom five and the top five. So when I have a, uh, an ARV range, which is somewhat accurate, so the, you know, the high end value, and then I've got the low end value. And it, almost predominantly, every single house you take back, especially lower value ones, are going to be in the low value range because they're not paying their mortgage. Not paying their taxes, there's no way they're putting money into it. Mm-hmm. So it almost always falls within the bottom five. That's just kind of like when I go in to do a bid, a bid analysis at pull those. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they're way freaking off. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, obviously, I always validate those uh, those bottom five comps just to make sure that it's in the the ballpark. And if it's higher than that, then it's a plus. But sometimes it's even lower. So <laughs> now, do you still have someone put eyes on the property for you? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that, that's what I want to get to is you still have, and I've done that a lot of times and you know, it's a mixed bag for me. I go back and forth. If I've got like eight assets under agreement, instead of trying to chase eight people down to go take pictures and pay them like 30 bucks on Craigslist or 25 bucks, sometimes I'd, I'll just call Dickie and be like, okay, Dickie, just get me these eight because of time. But yeah. um, you're right. I take the values of a BPO with a grain of salt. And what I'll do is I'll run an AVM and data tree as well as look at what they provide and come up with my own value. And I know people will look at, you know, all they do is look at the number on a BPO and not actually look at the information in there. And typically these agents are way off. Yeah. Another thing I do too is I'll get local agents to give me a CMA. And what that does is obviously it gives you way more than just the three comps they're using on the BPO. Yep. So I'll get a one-line CMA where they'll give all the comps within a mile or half a mile, every property, but mm-hmm. I'll take that and then I'll, uh, and, well, data tree will give most of that, but I find uh, realtors in each uh, jurisdiction have I mean, way more comps. So I'll pull those in and then um, put them into a spreadsheet or whatever and you know, mm-hmm. filter them out by uh, square footage and age and what have you. So that, that typically narrows it down. And I, you know, Oftentimes, I'll tell the agent, okay, I think this property is worth that and get them to agree to it. So, Because yeah. the other thing with BPOs too is, you know, sometimes you got to look at the comps and actually go online and look at them because I've seen BPOs from one company who I no longer use anymore, which is national. So I want to just be clear that this, because I mentioned Dickie's company earlier, this isn't his company and I still use Dickie and stuff I get from him is usually pretty good. But this other company I used to use, They'd use some of these BPO comps, and these would be houses that were like updated with new kitchens and baths, and try and sell, you know, say it's this is what the property is worth. And I'm like, okay, I can tell you right now, this person hasn't paid in two years, so I highly doubt it's got a new kitchen and bath inside this house. Yeah, that's that's one thing I definitely do. So when I pull those bottom five comps, I'll look at each one of those, and if it's an as is property, then yeah, I'm pretty darn sure that it mortgage in question that we're bidding on is likely similar to those. And it, it may be conservative a lot of times. Yeah, I may not win a bid because of that, but you know, the old saying, you know, the best deal you know, is the one you never get, right? So. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, and we were also just talking, you know, before you had stepped away briefly with Dan, because Dan is in the process of doing a fix and rent, you know, because the property right now is his best exit strategy is kind of fix it and rent it. And I know you had a lot of experience doing a lot of renovation side, but I wasn't sure if you typically, you know, exit your assets or you keep them as rentals. Well, I used to do uh, turnkey rentals as well, like back before I got into notes. And yeah, I actually heard part of that, Dan. You just mm-hmm. have to run your numbers. You got to see, um, you know, the 1% rule, that's good in theory, but Depends on how much the taxes are, depends on how much 
much, uh, you know, if you're renovating the property, obviously there's not going to be much maintenance, but, you know, taxes are usually the big kicker there. Now, if it's in Indiana, most places I know in Indiana, the taxes aren't too bad, so it probably won't uh, take that big of a chunk. If it yeah. was in Cleveland, taxes are freaking like three or four percent of the value of the property. So you want to be hitting the two percent rule in Cleveland. Um, Pennsylvania, the same. Pennsylvania yeah. taxes are with the school taxes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, so I, if you do it as a turnkey rental, how long do you rent it before you go to sell it? Like, what's the seasoning on a on a renter like? Oh, it could be the first month. Okay, you don't need, you don't need seasoning. I mean, a lot of um, a lot of buyers are going to want to see the application, see what their credit history is and their strength. So as long as you got a you know you have a good renter in there and that and you have a property manager that vets them properly, then you know, it shouldn't be a problem to turn around. I'm sure you've probably heard of Roofstock. Roofstock's a good place to put your rentals now. No. Yeah, I'll check that out. Let's Google them, Roofstock. They're like the preeminent, man, these guys have only been around a couple of years, and it's amazing what they've done the last few years. And they've actually just came up with fractional ownership. So I just saw a news article yesterday where you can actually buy a portion of a, a rental now. So it's kind of cool how they... Uh, to come up with that concept. Hmm. How do you spell their name, Chad? Roof Stock, R O F F S T O C K, I believe. Oh. Yeah. I think it's R O O F, not R O F F. No. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so, we got a lot of, uh, a lot of turnkey buyers are buying them because what they do is they'll send out an inspector. They'll still do the inspections. You know, they're really protecting the investors because there's been a lot of people ripped off in the turnkey rental business the last. How is fractional years. investing not an SEC violation? I don't know how they're doing it. I didn't really read much into it, but um, I think they might be doing it through a security. I'm not, I don't know. I didn't really look into it. I'm just curious because, I mean, it's like no difference. I mean, they're raising money you have. It's passive. You know, it's almost like a crowdfunding type thing where, you know, I'm wondering how they regulate it because I know... I, with Bitcoin and stuff, that's what they're trying to get to is a lot of fractional ownership of things. And I'm like, well, how is that not a violation? Yeah, they, they may be doing it as a security. I think they said they're retaining 10% ownership of each property or something like that. So but the idea is, is they're um, allowing people to invest. Say they get, someone's got 50 grand as opposed to putting it in one property and the freaking tenant leaves the next day and you know, you're out rent for a couple months and then the turnover costs. They're allowing you to take, say, out of that 50 grand, spitting up into five properties. So you put 10 grand into each, so that way you're allocating your, your risk across five properties. That's kind of what I understood from it. I'm like, oh, that's, that's a pretty interesting concept that they're, they're doing that now, so. It is interesting. Yeah, it's yeah. very interesting. It's, you're starting to see a lot more of Wall Street and other companies like this getting into single family rentals and creative things like this. It's, I'm interested to see how it works out once the markets turn a little bit and how they manage these properties. Mm -hmm. Casey asked, if you can get a longer lease, is it more attractive to a potential buyer? Oh, is he asking me that? Um, uh, <laughs> just, uh, I, I'll throw it out to everybody. Yeah. I have yeah, my opinions. I'm curious what other people think. Yeah, it definitely helps, but it all comes down to the strength of the, the renter, their credit scores and their, their past rental history and all that. So a good property manager that bets the, the borrower is, um, is worth his weight in gold, really. Higher the credit score, the better, I think, usually. And, and the income, income, too, obviously. You know, it's the same, same rules of getting a mortgage. You want to see it three times or more on, on the rental application. So. Yeah, in Maryland, you have to offer a two-year lease. But, you know, it's state law. But typically, I don't, really? like, I don't like to go more than a year because you just want to make sure, one, about the borrower they pay. But also, you want to make sure the borrower is not calling you every two days because, you know, the shower head's too low or the toilet's not flushing or, you know, some renters can be, you know, a little more high maintenance and you don't want to have to deal with that for multiple years. You can always take the first year and then if they're doing well, just roll them and, you know, renew, re, re up. Yeah. Okay. So Casey is asking questions of Dan. Casey's asking Dan if your property is somewhere that it would work as an Airbnb. No, this is in Muncie, Indiana. So I don't, I'm guessing there's not a lot of Airbnb. What it does have going for it, though, is it's very close to Ball State and some other things. So I think as a rent, it'll be okay. But Airbnb is probably not an option. Although um, 
it'd probably be better than the hotels there because the hotels are pretty dirty and horrible. I ended up flying out there last December when I realized they had the hoarders because I wanted to meet with the clean out folks and I interviewed a bunch of contractors and had a bunch of people look at it because this one was so extreme. I wanted to go out there and check everything out myself. And I have some other notes in the area too, so I kind of killed a bunch of birds with that stone. I just want to encourage you, Dan, to consider the possibility that it might actually be a good Airbnb area. Is Ball State, do they have like resident students? Do you know what the out-of-state residency is? I, I don't. I can um, check that out. Yeah, because um, a college that's got stuff going on, with parents, calm, families. There's like, it would be interesting to look at the school schedule to see how many, you know, events there are that people might come to. So you probably heard of Walter Wolford in Jackson, Mississippi? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so Walter has a whole bunch of Airbnbs in Jackson, Mississippi. And, you know, I somewhat incredulously said to him, like, seriously, like, you have that many people coming to Jackson, Mississippi? And he's like, yes. <laughs> hmm. And it's true of most places. Like, we, of course, think of the truly exciting destinations, San Francisco, Chicago, L.A., Philadelphia, a little bit. But, yeah, people go all over the place for all different reasons. So it would definitely be worth, like, you should just go on Airbnb and see what's in Muncie and what it rents for. Yeah, check that out because I had not thought about that mm -hmm. at all. So. It just seems like a lot of work to do an Airbnb. <laughs> well, you need a manager just like you do with a rental property, mm -hmm. like a normal rental. Mm -hmm. Well, I said I got a guy two doors away that can manage it. So. Yeah. Yeah, you need you know, a cleaning that, crew, and you need a manager. The logistics of it actually wouldn't be too bad, probably, in this case. Yeah, well, the visitors pay the cleaning fee, so you really just have to pay Airbnb, which is not very much, and the manager. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, and the income can be, you know, a lot higher than a conventional rental. Yeah. You have to check them. Kind of, you know, I never thought about this, but, like, turnkey Airbnbs, like, that's probably a great business. Or people who can't get the stuff set up themselves. Yeah. Like if you have like proven income in an Airbnb that's bigger than a normal rental, like you should be able to charge a premium price for it. Plus, you know, a lot of people do Airbnbs by renting properties instead of buying them and just, you know, making money on the spread. But I'm part of the reason that uh, landlords, you know, not everybody loves it on first hearing, but it's actually a great deal for a landlord if you agree to do automatic rent deposit into their accounts. You let them know this thing is going to get cleaned like regularly. The visitors use it very lightly, like they don't wear out the appliances, they barely use anything. They're vetted by Airbnb. You know, there's just there's a lot of advantages to it. I've yeah. already sent you the email, Gail, of the business plan of buying property from owner finance people under land contract and then turn around and Airbnb being it out to people. <laughs> You're not even on the title. You have it on the <laughs> land contract. You've got the low monthly payment, the low down payment, and you're going to Airbnb it. There you go. That is awesome. If only there was a, a land contract property that didn't need like thousands of dollars in renovation yeah. <laughs> to be somewhat acceptable to an Airbnb person. There's got to be one out there. Yeah. Dan, can I uh, interject? Do you know what your, your cap rate might be on this if you were to fix it up and rent it out? Yeah. So from what I'm told by a couple of different people, there are realtors and, and the property manager, it should rent for between 1000 to 1200 a month. And I think when I rehab it, by the time I rehab it, I'll, I'll be all in for probably 95000 maybe 100000 If I sell it as is, well, which I've already kind of started the rehab, but, but if I were just to sell it and not do it, it would probably be at least a 20K loss at that point so that was the the trade-off if yeah. you fixed it and sold it would it would you bring you closer to even or would you still be a little upset? yeah so so the the, the arv is 
it's supposed to be like 115 to 120 fixed up. How much work does it need, budget-wise? It's about 25K to 30K in work. It's tearing out the kitchen and two bathrooms and flooring and painting. I mean, luckily, structurally, it was okay. There's like exterior painting and there's a tree that's got to be removed and some other odds and ends. I mean, it's a bunch of stuff. I mean, it's pretty, I mean, these hoarders were pretty bad. I mean, luckily the house was okay underneath that, but the whole thing is pretty repugnant. Oh, was that the video you put on Facebook, Dan? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's the one. It's like oh. a three bedroom house. Yep. yep. That's it. And four dumpsters or something crazy. Wow. Yeah. They pulled out three 40 yard dumpsters. Oh my God. Trash and then one 20 yard dumpster. And then I ended up, I guess there was so much stuff they were like overweight because they ended up charging me a little bit extra later. So that was not construction debris. That was literally just stuff that was in the house. Correct. Yeah, there was no structure to be. I mean, luckily, I was worried at first we we're going to have to tear out the drywall. There's a couple of holes in the drywall we got to repair, but no, that's all in. It's not construction debris. They left a boat in the backyard. They left about five lawn mowers. There was, you know, it was about waist deep. Throughout most of it, it was probably about chest deep in the garage. And there were, uh, there were, there were I don't know how much more. There, there was a lot of gross stuff inside there, too. It was, yeah. I've got a property right now in Indiana where uh, we're wrapping up the forfeiture, which actually the notice expires on Monday. But there was a essentially about a dumpster worth of material out in the yard that I just had to clean up because I got a call from the county. They're like, uh, there's like a dumpster worth of stuff out in the yard from the house. So I'm thinking, oh, great. Hopefully they've already emptied out the house or is it going to be opposite that the house was so filled with so much junk. I'm going to go in there and need to probably pull out two more dumpster loads in this house because it's amazing how much stuff you can pack into like a thousand square foot home. How many dumpster loads of junk? Yeah, I just had, I just um, did a forfeiture in Cincinnati. It was, the home was just under a thousand square feet and they pulled out 46 yards out of that one. So they, they weren't quite full on hoarders, but it was a lot of stuff. Oh yeah. The other thing I should mention too, was when I, um, the one in Muncie, the original contractor that was going to do the clean out, they said, well, we use the HUD schedule. We charge $50 a cubic yard. We'll just let you know when, when we're done. Yeah. And I was like, no, 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 no. I need <laughs> fixed price you know, quote, and they came back, they wanted $17,000 just to do the clean out. Oh my God. <laughs> and then uh, I got another contractor. They came back, they quoted 13,000. Wow. And what I ended up doing was I, I talked to somebody here in Denver who does fix and flips and stuff. And he's like, Oh no, i have run into this. No problem. He's like, just order the dumpsters yourself, go on Craigslist and find some, some laborers. Yeah. And so I ended up the dumpsters cost almost 2000 bucks altogether for the the four dumpsters and the overages that's not bad uh, i found a small crew of guys it was a guy and his two sons out of indianapolis um did the whole cleanup for 1500 and just kicked butt so nice. for like 3500 i ended up getting the whole thing yeah that's out. one so that's one thing i found is stuff that is just regular labor work that you don't need they're not finishing drywall or painting you know if it's demo or trash outs I find most of my people on Craigslist, same thing, order dumpsters for five, 600 bucks or a dumpster and then pay somebody a thousand bucks on Craigslist. The thing you gotta be careful of is send somebody else by to make sure they actually did the full clean out. Cause in one instance, I had somebody who snapped pictures of the house, made it look clean. And what they did is they took one room and just threw everything in one room that was left because the dumpster was full. And instead of telling me to get a new dumpster, they didn't want to have to come back. So they just took a bunch of stuff and you know, threw it in, packed the room up. So I end up having, you know, paid them and end up having to get somebody else to do it. To finish Been there, it. done that. Yeah. What, what I ended up doing was since since I wanted to go out there to meet with contractors and see for myself, I met with them the day that they wrapped up. So I was going to pay them when I got there. <laughs> so I saw for myself, and yeah, did did it that way. So it was all good. But I I was really impressed. I mean, those guys really kicked butt. They weren't just cheap, but I mean, they really did a good job. So it was that's fortunate. And as long as you find those people, then you just wish you could fly them all over the country to do all your deals. We have a guy in New Hampshire who's like so awesome, but he's, he's in New Hampshire. He's not near anything else we're ever going to buy. Yeah. 
Okay. Does anybody have any other questions? Because I know Gail wants to get to bed and I'll go spend the next hour <laughs> looking at a tape or doing something working. So I'll keep myself. Anyway, Dan, I would, I would just I would suggest if, um, unless you want to hold this as a rental, I would try to fix it up and sell it. I'm running the math here and you're looking at like about an eight cap on your costs. And that's pretty much what the going rate is for even more on uh, rental properties. I don't know what it's like in Indiana, but you're probably not going to be able to sell it. Like I hate to burst your bubble, but you're probably not going to be able to sell it for much more for what you're into it if you were to sell it as a rental. Mm -hmm. If you can sell it as a retail, on the, get a little bit higher on ARV. Sell for the 115, 120. You might break even, make a few bucks kind of thing. Yeah. Unless you're, you know, unless you want to hold it for rental for a couple of years and you can collect. No, not really. I mean, I, I mainly, if I, if I could get out and break even, I'd be pretty happy because I had about five different things go wrong. Yeah. But this was one where I, I made a few mistakes and a bunch of things broke the wrong mm -hmm. way. So, so if I can get out of it with my butt, I'll be very happy. So oh, and then you, then you learn how to do a rehab too. Same token. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then you'll never want to do another one. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, like my 25 turned into 55. But, um, You're nuts, Jen. Um, You're crazy. <laughs> and, well, the reason it went, it went such higher, it, I was actually just going to do a lipstick and a pig and turn, in, turn around and sell it as a dollar finance deal again. Like yeah. a quasi harbor, but, you know, make it look a little prettier. <laughs> By the time... We like that the entire plumbing had to be replaced, all the electrical had to be replaced, furnace, the water heater, the foundation was crumbling. Like, none of that, you know. And we hired, I hired my uh, our favorite first rate field services <laughs> to do the initial walkthrough. And oh, this property doesn't look bad. <laughs> yeah, they are keen eyed. <clears throat> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, I mean, it's not their fault, obviously, but um, well. <laughs> a little, a little bit I, mean, I was a stupid one that bought the property. So I can't even get couldn't get them to send me a report because they were saying there's no internet in that in the area they were in. So I never knew that Maryland didn't have internet. <laughs> yeah, I'm not too sure what happened happened with them, but uh, anyway. But anyway, th this was part of a portfolio that I bought like ten properties and or ten CFDs and. It was actually when I try to get out of the last minute, John John was like, there's no freaking way you are getting out of this one if you want excellent pricing or you're getting all the other ones. So, but yeah, you just you kind of take one with a grain of salt, right? So Gail's going to hit me. Flip those babies, Chad. <laughs> yeah. Gail's going to slap me for asking one more question, but Chad, I wanted to ask you this because there was that tape that John put out that was from AHP that I know yeah. you had looked at prior and we all keep talking about it being pretty hairy assets and it sounds like you've actually done a lot of due diligence, maybe you already ordered ONE or BP or done BPOs on stuff like that. What were some of the things, if you don't mind, just sharing with that? Because when I looked at it, I know that the values of a lot of those assets were way off for what they had pricing on, but I was just curious. And again, I'm, there's nothing against the seller in this because they're a very good and reputable company. But those assets, I'm just curious uh, what your thoughts were. Well, when I got the tape, they didn't actually have values on it. So I ran it through my, uh, my comp tool and pulled the bottom five. And a couple of them, I was way off. Actually, speaking of which, that was a couple of them I had to go back to the, the original, uh, the person I got the tape from originally. Mm -hmm. And I was just talking to them yesterday. I'm like, uh, yeah, a couple of these are way, way high. And I'm like, I actually want to use their values that they put on the next tape that came out that John sent out. <laughs> because... Mm -hmm. When I came, when I had was uh, way higher than what they have. Uh, a lot of them are outside the statute of limitations. Um, well, specifically in the state of Ohio, there's a new ruling out in the state. Well, not a new ruling. Uh, it depends on which attorney you talk to. There's always been a six year rule on the statute of limitations there where you can no longer pay the borrower down to collect any further payments from them if they haven't it's been six years since they breached the contract, which basically means the default. But that's fine. Fun and dandy. So be it. If you buy the loan, you can't try to track them. You can't. It's basically like when they come out of bankruptcy and they, they, they have a chapter seven and they're personally no longer obligated to pay the debt anymore. You can still foreclose on them. Well, there was a BK ruling that came out last year that basically truncated the uh, statute of limitations to foreclose on the mortgage. 
of 15 years, and they combine it with the statute of limitations on the ability to collect the debt, which is six years. So they basically rule them one and the same. So there's a federal, because BKs are federal, decision that has basically truncated the two in, as the one, into one statute of limitation of six years. But it depends on the attorney you talk to saying, well, that's all hogwash. That's going to get overruled again. You know, it's the same thing as licensing in Maryland, right? <laughs> it's going to go back and forth, back and forth. So basically, there, there was a ton on there that were in Ohio that were well beyond the statute of limitations. Well, this new statute of limitations that were closed. So um, that was the only one. There's a bunch of Florida that were beyond the five years. Um, so, you, yeah, for new people coming in, you know, I'd highly advise against buying any of these. Just because there's, well, and then okay, for one, one I found, for instance, had a uh, probate sale, which was in 2012 or 13 or something. It was in the, the new owner's name. However, they still think that there's a valid loan on this property. I'm like, well, <laughs> how could that be if it's sold in the probate sale? Yeah. Obviously, the release of a lien was not executed or there was a number of satisfaction mortgage given. That's just one example. Um, another one. There was a bankruptcy proceeding. Oh, how did it go? Oh, they um, entered into a loan mod. Then he went immediately into a bankruptcy proceeding and uh, never paid a cent on the loan mod. So I can't remember what state this was in, but it was, I mean, well, since he didn't pay a cent in the loan mod, and even though he signed it, does that go back now on the uh, statute of limitations that he never paid a cent into it? So there's nothing to be enforced. I looked at, 30 or 40 assets, I think, and almost every one of them had some kind of hairy issue with it. So <laughs> I've been spending way, way more time than I care for on uh, doing the diligence on these. But it also comes down to a business decision. Are these borrowers going to be savvy enough to come back and have any knowledge of all these rules? And then they're going to hire a defense counsel to fight this for them. Well, to do a bit of homework on these borrowers and find out what they're, where they're living and what their incomes are and what have you, you know, kind of gives it the answer right there. So if you can get these at a good enough discount versus the value of the properties, then, you know, it's kind of like a, a risk versus reward at this point. I thought that once where I had a property that hadn't paid in a while and uh, had a low UPB. So I picked it up for very low dollar and let's just say it didn't end well for me. Um, the <laughs> borrower got an attorney and mm -hmm. um, basically fought it. And the problem is based on where the UPB is at and then maybe what the property's worth. And then if you're going to fight this thing, I mean, these things can cost you 20, 30 grand fighting them, depending on, you know, because typically what these defense attorneys will do is they'll put it into, you know, typically more, a more liberal court and, you know, submit a 30, 40 page claim and, file a counterclaim against you for fair debt and some of these other things, you know, all of a sudden I get it. And the attorney's like, what do you want to do? You know, spend $30,000 or, you know, just let it go. You know? So it's uh, I thought the same thing. It's like, okay, this borrower, you know, I looked him up and, you know, found out a lot of information about him, And I was like, this borrower is never going to get an attorney. And lo and behold, so I don't buy outside statute of limitations anymore. I'm 0 for 1, and I'm going to keep it that way. <laughs> well, these are, uh, these are all well underwater, yeah. and they all have significant taxes on them, significant code enforcement issues against them, are all the ones I've looked at so far. So I'm thinking that I could come along and just get rid of their headaches. So I think these people are probably sick and tired of dealing with these yeah. properties by now, and they just probably don't Want to want an exit, mm -hmm. and AHP's their uh, business model is to keep people in their homes, and they actually mean it, right? They never yeah, no, take any foreclosure, so that's why they're getting rid of all these because they realize that they can't do anything with any of the borrowers, so they're just selling them off. So, mm -hmm. as a you know, as with a lot of hedge funds are like that, right? Where they just don't want to take take it through the foreclosure and get a bad rap in the, mm -hmm. in the community, so. I missed the earlier discussion. Do you guys have any idea why they're taking so long to get back on, on bids? I heard there were over 300 bids. 300 <laughs> people bid. That's crazy. Oh, wow. wow. And there's only 480 assets. I think he said there was over 300, not 300 bids on assets, over 300 people that bid. Oh, my God. That's insane. Mm. 
That's hard to believe. Oh, I'm, I'm glad I got the tape early. <laughs> yeah, I'm skeptical. I'm, 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 going, I'm going back and forth with them right now, so I'm probably a dozen of them right now, so I'm not sure I'm going to close on all of them. Probably close on maybe half of those, I'm not sure we'll see. There was a couple that were like, oh, they were pretty decent in there. <laughs> However, I haven't actually, I haven't even ordered the title reports on these yet, because I usually do all my due diligence up front, like all the collateral review. Yeah. There's nothing worse than paying 200 bucks a pop and then you don't close on it. You know, you do that 10 times in a month and that adds up pretty quick. And that's one thing that I try and relate a lot of investors is, you know, as you set up your businesses, make sure you account for some lost opportunity costs throughout your year because you order an O&E, a BPO, and have a lawyer review it. You know, there's four or 500 bucks and those add up quickly. I've done that all too often. <laughs> Dan, right, so I did that at the beginning and now I've, uh, I mean, it's a lot more work on my part to review everything up front and then order the title report, but mm-hmm. just, you know, I saved you money in the long run. So I think last year I closed on between sixty plus assets, but I think my lost opportunity cost was about seven thousand, I think. So just wow. which I mean, one of them was harbor that was, you know, seven assets and I didn't close on a single one. That one that one hurt. Ooh. That one was like three grand. So I had Ooh. a lot of heartache with Harbor and not buying their assets. So we're we've still, except for those ones, Gail, we have, I don't think I've bought any other assets from them. Yes, we don't have Harbor to kick around anymore. <laughs> no. <laughs> still dealing with some of their uh, issues, especially in Pennsylvania. Had a couple there. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. The Attorney General is still coming out on that. So Yeah, yeah that I thought that, um, Scott proudly told me that he called them up and explained what we do and he thought he chilled them out, but are people still being threatened by the Attorney General and PA? Well, it's quieted down the last couple months, but I'm actually converting mine into no mortgages right now. And I've got an attorney that has I've had several conversations with them and billed me for it, of course, um, yeah. what we're doing. Yeah, the, <laughs> the conversion was going to be 500 bucks, and now they're like up to two grand. I'm like, whoa, how did this get so high? But just because of that. Yeah. Attorney General getting involved, and um, but yeah, they're they're totally on board with uh, what I'm doing. So mm. and dropping the interest rates down to six because the uh, usury laws in Pennsylvania are only six, which I didn't know at the time. Nor did mm. I. I actually live in Pennsylvania, and I have I have one conventional note here that's in foreclosure. <laughs> I've never done a contract for deed. By the way, for those who are listening, if you're converting notes, I believe Fannie Mae on the website has a note and mortgage template for every state. Ooh, very cool. From a, well, a I'm just, I mean, well, not if you're, I mean, I'm, why wouldn't you, if you're converting, just do a cancellation of land contract and then write a new note with mortgage? Uh, I'm not sure. This is how this attorney is doing it. Well, it, he's calling it a loan mod slash no mortgage. I don't know. That, that's what I, that right. <laughs> he saw an opportunity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. To build me more. Exactly. <laughs> Taking advantage of the nice Canadian guy. He doesn't know I'm Canadian. No, no one knows I'm Canadian unless they listen to the podcast that I'm on. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> well, you do have that accent, Chad. Yes, I do, eh? Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, okay, well, I want to thank... Well, I could do this all night. <laughs> yeah, Gil's like ready to uh, call it a night, so we'll... Uh, We'll we'll end our second episode of the evening. Uh, Dan, Chad, and everyone else, thanks for joining us this evening. And uh, again, for everybody out there, uh, look forward. Actually, next week, I want to say we are going to have Debbie Mullins on next week, who is bookkeeping for Note Investors. I know she does. I think Adam Adams introduced me to her, and I believe Wayne Snell and a few other people uh, use her. And we're going to bring her on because as tax year was closing, as people were wrapping up their taxes, a lot of questions out there and a lot of information that I think some of it's correct, some of it's not correct. So we wanted to bring somebody who does the day-to-day work on basically, you know, with QuickBooks or how to do your balance sheets and P&Ls and stuff. She's not an accountant, but she, I think, knows enough to get in trouble. But we'll be talking about uh, some bookkeeping and top five things to do and top five biggest mistakes that investors do with their books next week. With that, I want to say thank you all and go out and do some good deeds.
Thanks for tuning in to the Good Deeds Note Investing Podcast with Chris Seveny and Gail Anthony Greenberg. If you like what you just heard, feel free to share us with your friends and colleagues, as well as drop by iTunes and leave a rating or comment. You can visit our website at www.gooddeedsnoteinvesting.com to sign up for email updates for future shows and access all of our great content, including show transcripts, case studies, video tutorials, and more. Don't forget to join us next time for another episode on building your wealth and making a difference.